What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside Ryan Sullivan. And Ryan, last week we broke down the offense heading into training camp. And this week we're going to talk about the defense and the special teams, which you know we talked about it right before we start recording. The defense, as far as the back half of the roster, is going to really kind of relate to special teams greatly because, of course, that's what majority of these back half of the roster guys are going to be competing for, not just being the backups, but also contributing on special teams. Yeah, absolutely. You look through this roster, and it's unlike you go back to really old training camps where it's like, man, is Walt Power going to walk? Walt Powell going to be wide receiver four or is Greg Solis going to be wide receiver four? And now we're looking at rosters where the only real spots open for grabs is, you know, de defensive end six, cornerback five, uh, linebacker five. So there's not all the spots that are really be that to be had on this team aren't starting spots. They're got they are people who are going to have to be special teams contributors. Yeah, definitely. And and I think that, you know, although people really seem to get excited about when a back half of the roster guy on either side of the ball, too, because obviously some of these back end receivers and running backs are also special teams guys. You know, they make big plays on offense and they get excited. But people do have to remember that in order for these guys to even be active on the game day roster, they have to find themselves a niche on special teams. So uh, that's definitely something to you know kind of consider when you're you know when you see all these 53 man roster projections that people like to do is that you know some of these guys are going to be special teams players and especially you know Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott, uh they have made a emphasis on special teams more so than I think most teams in the NFL. So you know, I think that's something to consider here. Uh, the Bills are unusual with the amount of guys they have on the roster usually that are strictly special teams only rather than guys who can also give you some positional value. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's every training camp. We seem to fall in love with the, the draft pick or the undrafted guy with a cool story. And, you know, that's just not the case this year, especially on defense as we start to go through this roster, even less. So, you know, on offense, you can make arguments that maybe a guard spot was up for grabs you know, wide receiver six is probably a position that contributes on this team. That's a spot that's up for grabs. But on defense, all the snaps are really accounted for. When we get into defensive line, we can talk about the, the way they split the snaps, but there's not any starting jobs really out there to be had on this defensive roster. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be a tough roster to make, and I think that that kind of segues perfectly into – sort of the first position group we wanted to talk about, which is defensive, <clears throat> excuse me, defensive end, which speaking of hard to make, I mean, if you really sit down and think about it, the Bills have invested so much into this position over the last two years. You know, they paid Mario Addison. They drafted Epinesa on the second round. And then they made their first two picks of this year's draft, DNs and Gregory Rousseau and, and Boogie Basham. So this defensive end group is loaded with talent, honestly. A lot of potential, I think, here is the key word. And a lot of guys battling it out for not a lot of spots. So, Ryan, when you kind of just look at this, I mean, I guess I'll start with Jerry Hughes because, of course, there's already people talking about, oh, the Bills, they could save X amount of money with Jerry Hughes. And I know you and me are on the same page that Jerry Hughes is not getting cut by the Buffalo Bills this offseason. So, and there's a couple points to that. Number one, Jerry Hughes is still good. He still put up pressures with guys in the top half of the NFL. Bruce did a great job of breaking it out on Nap Show last week. I don't think you bring in young edge rusher talent, Espinessa and Rousseau and Boogie, and don't have a guy who's played, I think, eight years on this team now with, only, with never missing a game for injury. He's a guy you want on this roster 2021 is going to include Jerry Hughes because he can still play at a fairly high level. And the great thing about Sean McDermott defenses, and I feel like I'm probably going to touch on this point a lot throughout this, this recording here is a starter on a Sean McDermott defensive line only plays about 
65% of the snaps at most. And a lot of times it's not even that. So if other guys start to, if, if Rousseau, if Basham, if Espinessa, really even a guy like Obata start to prove that they're ready to take more snaps, you can take some of that workload off Jerry Hughes' plate. So there is absolutely a role on this team for Jerry Hughes. And, and the $6 million, I think it is, that you, you save him cutting him just isn't worth what you'd be losing in a veteran, talented presence. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I like, you know, I want to start off with your first point about pressures. I, I I did a little research, and these are the guys that Jerry Hughes is at as far as the pressures. I mean, he had as many pressures as Frank Clark. He had more pressures than Chase Young last offseason. I mean, or last season, excuse me. So this is still a guy, despite his age, <clears throat> excuse me, that is very productive. And not to mention a leader on that defense. I mean, the players respond to him. They really, excuse me. I don't know why I don't like scratchy throw. I think my allergies have been acting up a little bit. I probably not the best taking my allergy meds Hold on. Okay. Much better. All right. Back to his thing. The, the guys really respond to Jerry Hughes. You know, he, he's a leader in that defense and you saw this off season or this past season. So, I mean, we saw when the bills cut for a Jackson, right? what that did for the team top to bottom, right? How the guys were so devastated that a leader that they went out there and gutted with was just cut. So Sean McDermott, Brandon Breen, they value culture. As we know, they value veteran leadership. And I think cutting Jerry Hughes would be completely opposite to what they've built over the last couple of years. Yeah. And, and, Jim Manos made that point on Rico's broadcast when he had Rico on when he was on Rico's show a month or two ago that he really regretted cutting Fred Jackson at the point that he cut Fred Jackson. And we talked about when Nate Geary was on this show. Sean McDermott knows what the John or Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, if part of the success is knowing when to let guys go and He's just Jerry Hughes isn't at that point yet. And maybe 2022 will be that point. Maybe this is Jerry Hughes' swan song. And, you know, hopefully we win a Super Bowl and we can send him off and he, we can retire and be and be a Buffalo Bills legend. But, you know, th- there's really no question that he's going to be on this team. And when I look at the rest of this line, there's no – the really only question is, is there going to be – five defensive linemen or they're going to be six defensive linemen if there's six is it going to be bam johnson or is it going to be fa obata because let me tell you jerry hughes is making this roster like we just said i know there's a lot of animosity out there towards guys like mario addison who didn't play as well as jerry hughes but his with his restructure and his contract guys he's a lock whether you like him or not i understand you may not like him at, at, for his contract value, all that stuff. He's got $8 million dead cat pip with the post-June 1st. It, it can be spread out over two years, but with, with his restructure, they owe him $2 mil in a void year after this. So Mario Addison's not going anywhere. And then Espinessa, Basham, and uh, Rousseau are all going to make this team as well. That's five guys that are all going to be locked onto this roster. So the only question... Starting to tie in that special team stuff is is Effie Obata a player who played well, got a decent amount of pressures last year, and got five sacks in Carolina. Is would he be that sixth guy, or is Bam Johnson somebody who has been a special teams stud for this team and an important role in what Heath Farwell's built on that side of the ball, able to. to hold off F.A. Obata, because let me tell you, this, the, there's not going to be seven defensive linemen on on this roster. That roof's going to be six, so it's F.A. Obata or, or it's Bam Johnson. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that is the discussion because, you know, Hughes is making this roster, you know, Addison's making this roster, Epinesa, Boogie, and Rousseau, they're all making this team, plain and simple. They've invested a lot into those five players from a leadership standpoint, from a, you know, Asset standpoint, with the money they've given Addison, they extended Jerry Hughes. They've invested high picks in those in Epinesa Boogie and Rousseau. 
So I think it does come down to, right, like you said, is it five ends or is it six ends? And if it's six, is it Obata or is it Bam Johnson? And I think it comes down to what do the Bills want? Because, sure, Daryl Johnson is a fantastic special teamer. He's one of the best special teams guys on the roster, but as a defensive end, as an actual defensive lineman, he gives you pretty much nothing versus F.A. Obata, who I will say, I think before the Bills drafted Boogie Basham, I think he had a pretty good chance of making this roster. I think Boogie Basham is a very similar player style-wise to what F.A. Obata does. So it comes down to essentially, you know, is F.A. Obata good enough, I think, worth keeping over Bam and probably keeping over another player at a different position because traditionally speaking, the Bills don't go more than about five DNs on the active uh, on the 53-man roster. So six would be very unusual for them. But on the other hand, though, Ryan, when you do think of, you know, you look at it, I mean, this team did struggle getting pressure with four guys. And if F.A. Obata is a guy who can come in there and help bring the quarterback down, in, you know, I, they might have to make that decision of keeping six DNs. And, and I think it's important to note, I think, I know sometimes we, we get frustrated with the national coverage of the Bills because of some, we feel like guys aren't really uh, plugged in to what goes in at one Bills drive. But there was a lot of plugged in national writers who were really in on the FA Obata signing. Nate Tice over at the Athletic was loves FA Obata. I think Warren Sharp was really in on FA Obata. There's a lot of people in the league, not just in Bill's circles that think F.A. Obata is a really good player or has the potential to be a really good player on this team. And ultimately, like you said, it comes down to it's not it's not can necessarily even that F.A. Obata can beat out Bam Johnson. It's can can, you know, can he provide more value than say maybe another DT? Can he he's also battling guys outside his position group? Does a sixth defensive end bring more value than another defensive tackle? Does a fifth defensive end beat out, you know, an, an extra wide receiver? So it's not necessarily that he's just battling for that spot. He's battling to make his position more valuable than maybe adding someone else and a different position, adding more depth in a different position group. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what's, I think, going to have to come to this equation is, well, do you consider Boogie Basham or, I guess, F.A. Obata like, do you consider them really like edges? Like, what is their kind of a desired role for these guys? Because we expect that for sure, Boogie and if F.A. Obata makes the roster him too, that they're going to line them up inside on passing downs, you know? So, and I think another thing to consider here is this too is the Bills clearly lost that kind of edge setting end when Shaq Lawson left in free agency when when they you know that they really struggled with that specifically in the run game is really setting that edge and not allowing the running back to you know hit the outside and if obata can come in and be a really stout run defender as an edge guy again i think that will just only make him harder to cut but it's going to be really interesting i know it's real early brian but what do you, do you think they keep 60 ends or do you think they just keep five i think it's hard i i think this is the spot it's a deep it's a deep position group there's no studs but I think there's absolutely a way that you can rotate in six defensive ends throughout the course of a game. You're not going to give them all a ton of snaps, but with guy with Rousseau and Basham and their ability to reduce down inside on certain downs, you may be able to play around and give more snaps to more guys and bring in more guys fresh and really have a really, really diverse passing attack and almost more fascinating to me to discuss than the discussion around uh that the back end guys is i'm fascinated on your opinion on what the first and second year player snap counts are going to look like uh you have aj epinesa who i think is kind of the law is kind of lost in the discussion a lot of this someone who was trending upward towards the end of last year in terms of a snap count was starting to get some sacks. Looks like he was starting to put it together at the end of last year. And then Rousseau and Basham. I know a lot of people say Basham has the higher floor and maybe day one ready more so than Greggy Rousseau. But 
if everything is true about Greg, they said, uh, you know, uh, Leslie Frazier has come out and said, Gregory Rousseau learns really fast. And, you know, a lot of, you know, there's always a lot of smoke and a lot of puff and, and stuff that comes out during OTAs and training camps. But we kind of have evidence of that, right? He came into Miami as someone who never played edge rusher before and put up 15 sacks without really knowing what he was doing. So we know there's evidence that he learns fast. So I'm curious, what do you think out of those three right there, the, our second year player in AJ and then Greg and Bastion, what do you think their snaps counts look like? What do you think kind of role they have on this team? So it's a quick little like add on to what you're talking about with, with Rousseau being a, a fast learner. This is kind of an interesting, kind of a fun story. So my, one of my cousins, Ryan, went to the University of Miami and did their undergraduate athletic training program. So he worked a lot with the football team. And one of his first tasks he did was uh, Rousseau as a freshman, he broke his leg. So my cousin was a part of the rehabbing team with him during the off season. I was getting his leg healed up uh, for the next season. And so when the Bills drafted him, I texted my cousin. I was like, hey, like, what do you know about Gregory Rousseau? Because uh, he actually knew Jaquan Johnson a little bit back when Jaquan Johnson was on the Hurricanes. And he said, the first thing he told me about Rousseau, he said he's a great guy and, the, and an insanely fast learner. He said he picked up everything we told him to do so quick and effortlessly. And so although, you know, so I think that does kind of lean to what we're hearing and why I'm not so surprised to hear that because this has been documented that he is a very fast learner. I think out of these three, I think come the start of training camp, I think Epinesa is going to have the majority of the reps just because he, you know, as McDermott has always done, right? The rookies have to earn it. They usually kind of sit behind the vets and learn. And at this point, although Epinesa is a young player, he's no longer a rookie. And I mean, he's that third defensive end behind Hughes and Addison. So I think that he'll get majority of the snaps. And then between Boogie and, and Rousseau, I think it just comes down to who, who's more pro ready. And of course, most people will tell you that's Boogie Basham. To be honest, I think that Rousseau has a chance to produce as a rookie just because he's got you know, so much ability with that size, at least even getting the passing lane with his long arms and everything. So I, I think it's kind of a toss up between those two, but I, I, I will say this though. I am curious to see, and this might be something we don't see till later down the line, but I know some people have thought of the idea of maybe Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison because they're both not the best run defenders. Is having those guys be more sort of situational pass rushers and having Epines and Boogie be your base defense ends who can set that edge against the run and if it comes down to that then maybe bookie is the guy who gets a lot more reps than rousseau but we'll see i think but but sitting here on july 22nd because this is when we are recording um i think epinesa will get more snaps than the other than 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 bookie and and rousseau and i think with bookie and rousseau it just kind of comes down to who does the coaching staff have more confidence in at this point in their careers now, I, I know we spend a lot of time on the defensive line here, but I think that's because it's, I, I think it reflects just the depth. And I just think that the really interesting storylines that exist in this group. But if I were to say Epinesa, Rousseau, and Basham combined for 16 and a half sacks next year, would you would you take the over or the under on that? And would you consider that successful if they combined for 16 and a half sacks? So we're saying they each get roughly... Little over five, five. Like, like a little over five sacks. I think that's successful because I mean, the Bills' leader in sacks last year was AJ Klein with five and a half. So, if you have three young players who all are essentially are matching that, I, I would say that that's generally a success, especially because the Bills rotate D linemen so much that it's hard for guys that's with that much rotation to get 10, 11, 12, 13 sacks. I mean, I'm pretty sure I think I was listening to Joe Marino, he looked through it. And the Bill and, and, and Sean McDermott's defense, right? He it sits and he's been you know a D coordinator for nine years. He's only had three players have double digit sacks in his defense. I think it was Greg Hardy twice and Charles Johnson. You know, so getting double digit sacks isn't so easy when you're being rotated so often. So if if you have those three young guys who can get you five five and a half sacks this season, I think that's not too bad from young players. You know who who right now still are miles away from their prime. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think it would be a successful, a successful venture too, considering Chase Young last year had seven sacks. Nick Bosa was a, had nine sacks as a rookie. So there's not really 
precedent for rookies coming in and having double digit sack seasons. Exactly, exactly. And we've talked about the, the DN so much, but there's also the D tackles too. Like I think we you know we can't forget about them as well. And I, I think Ryan, when I'm looking at the D tackles, there, there's a three questions I think that kind of come to mind here. It's one, is Ed Oliver gonna break out this season? I think two is if Star Tulele is going to be at that level we saw him in 2019 where he was freeing up every one of the D line and the linebackers. And I think three, and this is more of a back half thing, but honestly, how like how how safe is Vernon Butler for making this roster? So I'm curious, I guess, for the first question here with Ed Oliver, like do you do you think, Ryan, that Ed Oliver is finally gonna kind of be that disruptive player that the Bills, you know, thought they got when they drafted him? Or is Ed Oliver just kind of what Ed Oliver is at this point? If you've been following me all offseason, you, you people know what my stance is on Ed Oliver. It's not like he hasn't flashed. It's not like he's been some dud. He does, A, a lot of things that just don't show up on the stat sheet. He's di- disruptive, creates pressures, not bull rushes. You can put together a highlight tape of just phenomenal plays by Ed Oliver where he's making guards and centers look absolutely childish with, with the way he can just bull rush them with it with his brute strength and his elite athleticism for his position. So, you know, I, I think he absolutely is going to take that jump with a guy with star next to him. He's just too talented. He's too high ceiling of a player not to take the step up in in 2021. And, you know, I, I've I've been on the at Oliver train all offseason. And I, you know, a, a guy that I think is he's a different type. I'm not I don't want to make it a cop because They're different type of defensive tackles, but Cam Hayward is a is a you go back and look at his pro reference, and he didn't have eight sack seasons. He didn't start really producing till his third year in the league. I think with Star back in the lineup next to him, and I think maybe even Harry, who started to take Mm -hmm. Star Latula sacks before he got injured in 2019, I think will really help him elevate his game. And this, I think not only will Ed Oliver improve, I think Ed Oliver is going to be a storyline in 2021 with how well he plays. Yeah. I, I like that you brought up star and Harrison Phillips because Harrison Phillips coming back to the ACL, you know, I think people are forgetting how well he played in the playoffs and how well he played before the ACL. Like I think he's starting to kind of, get into a little bit of rhythm, which would be huge for the Bills. And I, I agree with you. I think Ed Oliver, listen, I think when people were saying that he's going to be the next Aaron Donald, I uh, I think I thought it was ridiculous then, and I think that it's forever going to be ridiculous to compare anyone to Aaron Donald because he's one of one. He, you know, they don't... Not only, they don't not only that, Aaron Donald is probably the best football player in the history of football. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the best <laughs> defensive lineman to ever play the game. Like, I, I don't think people understand how unbelievable he is. And just because Ed Oliver was undersized, everyone wanted to make that comparison. And I thought that was a super lazy comparison. I still think it is. The I think the guy that I look at, Ed Oliver, I hope being, honestly, and I said this now, and this is before my time, but I don't know if you're familiar with John Randall. He played on the Vikings in the, in the 90s. He was a little bit of an undersized guy. But that is a guy who you know took a little time in the league to get going. But once he did, he, he turned out to be a hell of a player. So I agree with you. I think Ed Oliver... You know, his rookie year, he flashed a lot. Last year, he was really lacking that big one tech to keep him clean. And I think for Ed Oliver, too, for being an under uh, undersized D tackle, it has taken a little bit of time to adjust and learn how to win because he can't just, you know, overpower guys so much like he did in college. This is the NFL. You know, he's given up 30, 40 pounds to some of these interior offensive linemen. So I, I think that Ed Oliver, the fact that he hasn't gone crazy and two years, I don't think it's anything to get too concerned about. He's got so much football ahead of him, and he's such a young player. You know, we, we talk about the Tremaine Edmonds. Ed Oliver is a very young guy. I believe he's not even 24 years old, so I think people need to kind of, you know, hold off a little bit at Oliver because there's a lot of great football ahead of him. 
and, and, and I'm telling you guys, go if you have game. I always tell people to look on Game Pass, but go on Game Pass, type in that Oliver's name. There's a lot of plays that get attributed to him just in terms of and that the, the play that stands out in the Miami game. I don't remember when it was, but there's a play in the Miami game where they're on, they're going to where they're trying to make running at the goal line. So one of the goal line plays in the first Miami game, Miami this year, where he takes the guard, throws him, and gets into the backfield to to disrupt the play. So he he's a freak. And not only do I, you know, if he comes up, if he can be, it's get seven, eight sacks from an interior defensive line position. We, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. Interior pressure ruins offenses. If he can be a disruptor from the interior position, that is absolutely script changing for this team. Absolutely. I, I, I agree 100%. And, I, again, I, and I think that Star coming back and Harry being healthy is going to contribute to that greatly. Now, I do want to just talk about this one guy just because, Ryan, he he is one of my favorite Bills players, and I try not to fall in love with back half roster guys, but this is the one guy that I can't help it. And I can't lie, I'm a really big Justin Zimmer fan. And I'm just curious what your thoughts on are because I thought Vernon Butler was pretty you know, underwhelming and disappointing last year, and that's kind of been the theme of his career outside of his last year at Carolina – is that he's just been a very underwhelming player. Do you think that there's a real shot that Justin Zimmer, who I thought made a lot of plays last year, you know, in limited reps, could beat out Vernon Butler for that fourth D tackle spot? Because I don't think they're keeping five D tackles. So to expose my biases too, you know, I, I started back after that Kansas City game, I started the Justin Zimmer fan club to the point where I had Ferris State and Justin Zimmer's mom retweeting me on Twitter. I love Justin Zimmer, fan favorite, great story to to root for. Everyone knows those <laughs> the plays where you see him running down the field on on broken plays or on pick sixes, and he's running right there with the Tyree kills and Teron Johnson's going down the field. So he, he's a hard guy not to love. I think it's important though with Vernon Butler to remember that though his contract's not as bad as Mario Addison, his contract still makes it relatively not it doesn't incentivize getting out of it next year and i think that's important to remember on top of that vernon butler started to play better towards the end of last year he didn't make a ton of flash plays but he finished on an upward trajectory which might be the reason why he ended up on this roster instead of quentin jefferson if you remember some of our first shows was us talking about how we wanted Vernon Butler cut instead of Quinn Jefferson. But the fact that they didn't and the fact that this contract is what it is, I think he really needs to play terrible or Justin Zimmer really needs to come in and and ball out in preseason. If I had to put money on it, I think Vernon Butler is going to be the guy that makes this team. I think to the chagrin of a lot of fans, obviously, but, I think it's important to remember Vernon Butler's had nine sacks before in a season from the defensive tackle position. He was a draft pick by McDermott. There is some pedigree. He was a first round draft pick top 10, I think. So there is some pedigree there. It'll nothing. I think he's more likely than a guy like Mario Addison to get cut, but I, he's someone that once again, like Mario Addison, just his contract and, what they signed him for is going to make it hard for the Bills brass to justify outright cutting him at the, at the end of training camp this year. I think I think we'll see. I mean, I, I though I do agree with you about his contract, I do think that his roster spot is not a guarantee just because at the end of the day, he did have to take a pay cut to remain on this roster. So there is a piece of me that thinks that, like, listen, if Justin Zimmer, I, th- I agree with you. I think unless either Vernon Butler plays to the point where they're he, he's a problem on the field. He is, you know, just no good or that Justin Zimmer plays to a level where they cannot cut him, similar to kind of what we saw Bam Johnson do as a rookie where there was just no way he was going to make it to the practice squad. I think unless that happens, I think you're right. I do think Vernon Butler likely will be on the roster over Justin Zimmer, but I think to the Bills fans that are big Zimmer fans, um, I think that there is a chance for Zimmer to make it over Butler. But like we said, though, it's going to have to be 
one or two ways, or it could be both have to happen. We'll see. But D tackle though is definitely going to be, I think, a position mainly. It comes down to I think Ed Oliver and does he take that step? And if he does, I think this is a completely different defense than what we've seen over the past couple of years. Absolutely. And, and and ultimately, I think that there's a path for five on, on this defensive tackle too. But ultimately, it comes down to like we said with the other group: can a fifth defensive tackle be more valuable than say a sixth defensive end? So there is there's a story you could tell me where that happens, obviously. But out of this group and out of the likely group, so there's you know there's really five like guys who really have a chance: Bryant, Jones, Hester, Anaku aren't going to make this roster. Really, the only guy, the guy that has the longest climb on, on that roster is going to be Justin Zimmer. Absolutely. So as we kind of move on here to the linebacker position group here, there's not much to really talk about here with the linebackers because it's it's pretty set in stone at this point. I mean, the Bills have about four linebackers who are locks to make this roster. Obviously, Tremaine Edmonds, Matt Milano, A.J. Klein, Tyler Matikiewicz, these are guys who aren't going anywhere. Um, I think that the only real discussion here is that does Edmonds make that big jump? I think that's the big topic of discussion here because we could talk about you know Tyrell Adams versus Tyrell Dodson. They both might make the roster. One or the other might make the roster. I you know I'm not so sure, but I think that this linebacker group will be significantly elevated if Edmonds can you know, make that jump kind of what we thought we were going to see after 2019. You know, he kind of regressed last season. Yes, he had the injury, but if Tremaine Edmonds can turn into that perennial Pro Bowl Mike linebacker, which I think we were starting to see towards the end of 2019, that could be monster and that could be huge for this Buffalo Bills defense. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. There is a super fascinating difference between what fans seem to think of Tremaine Edmonds and what players and executives think of Tremaine Edmonds. Number one, he's made a two straight Pro Bowls where he didn't get the fan vote. It was all players and coaches who got him in last year and definitely this year. ESPN just did a a player did an executive player power ranking type thing and they had Tremaine Edmonds listed above guys that you would think are, are a lot better than him in their play. So coaches and players clearly have a lot of respect for Tremaine Edmonds, but the story we talked about in 28, the story in 2021 is going to be, can that 2018 draft class, 2018, 29 draft class, 2019 draft class take the step up? Cause there's no more excuses this year. There's no excuses for Tremaine Edmonds. There's no excuses for Dawson Knox. There's no excuses for Ed Oliver. Tremaine Edmonds, when healthy, with Matt Milano next to him, with Star in front of him, has to return to that level of play. No one's going to be making the same excuses that that he made last year. And I, I'm confident he is. That I know this show we're really gonna. I feel like we're gonna come off as homers, but he regressed this year. He had the shoulder injury, I think played a major role in it. But say whatever you want about this year. In 2019, he was legitimately a Pro Bowl linebacker. He was legitimately very, very good at his job in 2019. So once again, it's like at Oliver, it's not like we haven't seen this. We haven't seen a high level of play. It's not like we're waiting to see Ed Oliver flash this immense talent that he has. We've seen it. It's just putting it together with consist excuse me, with consistency and having a deep defensive line in front of him and ha- having Matt Milano back next to him, I think helps him string that together on a consistent game to game basis. And we'll start and we'll see that Pro Bowl play from Tremaine Edmonds on a on a consistent basis. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more there on that one, Ryan. And you know, I, I, Tremaine Edmonds said it last, or I don't know, I might have been actually Leslie Frazier who said it. This was the first time in Tremaine Edmonds' career that he was playing through an injury. He's never really been hurt in his career. And, you know, I think you do have to give him some credit for gutting it out with a pretty bad shoulder injury, which a lot of people said he should have been resting rather than playing. And there's no question that affected his game. I mean, you could tell there were moments where it, he just wasn't right. 
So I think that he's had a full off season to get healthy, to get right. He's got his sidekick and Matt Milano back, which I, I, I agree with you. I don't think people talk about it enough because a lot fell on his plate when Milano went down and it was just him and AJ Klein because Klein's not the same coverage guy and the same blitzer that Milano is. And Edmonds had to take even more responsibility on. So I agree with you. I think that Edmonds will be fine. I think he'll rebound. At the minimum, I think he'll be at the 2019 level we saw him, which, like you said, that's a legit, no doubt about it, Pro Bowl linebacker, which if the Bills can at least get that play out of him, I think they'll be fine. But personally, I think he can do even better than that. I think he's going to have a pretty darn good season. I'm really not too concerned about Tremaine Edmonds. And on top of that, he's such a leader. The players love him. He is the team captain on that side of the ball with Jerry Hughes. So I I agree with you. I think that Edmonds is going to have a nice year this season. Now, do you have a strong opinion one way or another? Because really, the, the the position battle here is for one spot, linebacker five. Klein, Milano, Matikevich, all uh, locks on this roster. And as opposed to previous years, you really have a bunch of guys here that all have, with the exception of Mike Bell, have all played legitimate NFL snaps. Terrell Dotson played for the Bills last year. Tyrell Adams had a ton of tackles for the Texans. Uh, Giles Harris was a starter for Jacksonville. And uh, Andre Smith was someone who was a really important special teams contributor for the Bills last year. So do you have a, a particularly strong opinion about who wins that linebacker five job on this team? Well, I think it comes down to do the Bills want five or six linebackers? If they want five, I think I'm going to lean towards Adams, Dodson, or Giles Harris just because they're also not only special teams guys, but they've played actual linebacker. You know, they're not just special team only guys, which is where I think Andre Smith is probably not making this roster. Um, I mean, between those three, it's hard not to lean towards the Tyrells and Adams and Dodson because we've seen Dodson play in Tyrell Dodson can make some plays. I mean, he, he had some really great plays, specifically in that Miami game. I remember he had a couple of really flashy plays and good hits and nice coverages. And obviously Tyrell Adams started a ton of games for Houston last year. And I think was, I don't know if he was their leading tackler or second leading tackler, but he had a ton of tackles last year and was a legit starting linebacker. So, you know, if they're going to keep a fifth or sixth linebacker, because Matt Cave is already a special teams only guy. You might as well keep a guy who can come in as a backup if there's an injury to somebody and 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 contribute. Now, I will say this though: this is just a real quick question, at or um, Ryan. I think it was uh, Joe Marino who who mentioned this, and he said that he'd actually rather see potentially Tyrell Adams kept over AJ Klein because he thinks that Tyrell Adams is a better Sam linebacker and a base four three. What are your thoughts on that? I'm just curious. This is probably the last question we'll talk about these linebackers, but I'm just curious. Do you, do you think that that could be a possibility? Klein has a really hard to get out of contract too. I think you only save two or three million. You end up with a pretty decent chunk of of dead cap. The question with Tyrell Adams is obviously, did he get a lot of tackles because he was really good, or did he get a lot of tackles because he was Preston Brown in a bad defense? The tape seems to show that he's decent. He he's not a he's definitely not a liability. We know. I, I don't know what I won't sit here and pretend I know what Tyrell Adams can can do in coverage or if he can be a sideline to sideline guy. I I just didn't didn't watch that many Texans games, and I think that's the ultimate question. Once again, Klein's contract isn't impossible to get out of, but we know that a he's a McDermott guy from Carolina. We know that he knows this defense really well. And we know that he's also generally, I know he was a liability those first few games, but at the end of the last year, right before Milano and and Edmonds came back, he was was holding his own. He was doing what you needed him to do. And I think it's hard to get rid of those type of players just because of the value of experience and expertise they have of this particular defense. But I think I would give Tyrell Adams the inside track on the last linebacker spot here over a guy like Dodson just because we've known he's played it 
at a starting level. And Dotson put up put on some good things in tape when he played, but he also put in, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that the two games that he played in with Miami and Tennessee were two of our the Bills' worst defensive performances they put on tape last year. So I like Terrell Adams a lot. Probably not for me, not at this point, until I see some preseason football, not enough to, to, to unseat A.J. Klein. But it, it's just nice to know that that last linebacker spot, as opposed to previous years, is really a competition between legitimate NFL players and not guys that were bagging groceries at Wegmans two weeks ago. Yeah, definitely. And that's been the thing, you know, as the, as, and I, that's something I've noticed, Ryan, specifically once we started this podcast, sort of really sort of breaking down this roster again, like the depth on this roster is really impressive. I mean, there's not a lot of guys who are here thinking like, Oh, they'll make the roster. Maybe they won't that I'm sitting here saying, I don't know if they're really NFL players, which again, in years past, couldn't really say that, but yeah, I agree with you. I think this linebacker room is, 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 is probably gonna be in pretty good shape. And it, it, you know, I, I agree. I think we'll see what happens there, but let's get into the secondary here, which um, I think we need to mainly focus here on the CB2 battle because, you know, I think that the safeties, it's pretty obvious who they're, who they're keeping. It's going to be Poyer. It's going to be Hyde. It's going to be Jaquan Johnson. And it's probably going to be Damar Hamlin, who appears to kind of be almost a exact copy of Dean Marlowe, uh, just in a younger body. So, I think it comes down to really that CB2 because, you know, Trey White, he's locked down. He's shut down. All pro. Enough said there. Right? Taron Johnson, I thought, although struggled in the beginning last year, played very well at the end of the year and ultimately made two of the biggest plays of the season for the Bills. And they like him. It just comes down to Levi Wallace versus Dane Jackson, which I we've talked about this quite a bit, this, this, this battle between these two players. Everyone's been talking about it. And we're not going to really know until a preseason football you know, starts and get to see these guys getting reps with the ones and the twos and see who really sticks out. But do you think – I'll frame this question because I think this is maybe the right way to put it. If Levi Wallace is you – know, he wins the battle between him and Dane Jackson, are you worried about him being CB2? No. Levi Wallace – they try to replace Levi Wallace – Every single year they brought in that they brought in all types of different players to try to unseat him. Levi Wallace holds his job down year after year after year. And we've talked about it multiple times. And I bang the table. Levi Wallace is not the greatest cornerback in the world. But when you grade him on a scale of other cornerback twos, not grading him against cornerback ones, grade him about other teams, cornerback twos. He is about middle of the pack to maybe over the mean for cornerback, for cornerback twos in the NFL. He's obviously, yes, we, we I mean, we, we pawned the table on here for an upgrade in, in the offseason if we're being intellectually honest. But at the end of the day, you know McDermott trusts him. You know he's not a liability on that side of the ball. And He's just he's he's a veteran at this point who I think you can trust. Dane Jackson is the new shiny thing now, and that happens every training camp. I think we have a lot of Levi Wallace fatigue because we've seen him, we've seen him play well, we've seen him play not well. And Dane Jackson, we saw him play a couple games, we saw him break up a, a pass from DeAndre Hopkins, and we saw him get a pick against the Jets. And we're like, well, this guy, he's got to be the next big thing. When in reality, he absolutely could be the next big thing. But like I've been saying all offseason, he's got a lot of the same physical traits that we hate about Levi Wallace. He's not the fastest and he's not the biggest. What he does have over Levi Wallace is probably a little bit more aggressiveness in the way he plays. That said, I'm not overly concerned either way about which one wins the job because at least I know if Dane Jackson wins it there will be a suitable backup there behind him to kind of backstop any shortcomings he may have as he play as he starts at that position for as a second year pick who's a seventh round or as a second year player who's a seventh round pick you know a, a year ago right I think I agree with you for sure I think that 
Levi Wallace, I don't think people realize that when you look at most teams, having two corners, right, in the top, we'll say 30 to 35 corners in the National Football League, it's kind of rare to have your CB1 and CB2 be like top half guys in the league. Not everyone's going to have a Jalen Ramsey and then have a Darius Williams on the other side of the field. Like what the Rams have is uncommon. It's not that it, – it's pretty rare. So, you know, and I think when you when you look at it too, when the Bills re-signed Levi Wallace, that was graded, I think, by Bleacher Report as one of the best – signings of the entire offseason for how cheap they got him in comparison to some of these other cornerbacks who got Warren re-signed. Sharp loved it. Warren Sharp he, that he it was his it. favorite signing of the of the offseason. And I know that Levi Wallace, listen, is he a limited player? Yes. He's not the strongest. He's not the fastest. He's not the quickest. He's been burned before. Uh, and of course, when he goes against a guy like a Jarvis Landry, that is a mismatch. And for most corners, I think you could probably say the same thing. There's not a lot of guys that are going to shut down a receiver like a Jarvis Landry or like a Tyreek Hill. So I think fans have to, you know, realize that yes, Dane Jackson or not, excuse me, Levi Wallace is not perfect. He's not the best cornerback in the world, but I don't think people remember how bad CB2 was for the bills before Levi Wallace was inserted into the lineup. I don't think people remember Vontae Davis, how bad he was in his one half of football. Sharice so, Wright. Sharice Wright. Philip Gaines. I mean, I don't think people remember. I mean, do you remember what's, I think his name was, um, was it Greg Maven? I think McDermott's first year who got like a start or two. Ryan and Lewis. Just, Ryan Lewis. Exactly. I mean, these, I don't think half these guys are in the NFL anymore. So I think people have to remember that having a liability, a corner is such a problem that it's not worth the risk of trying to get rid of Levi Wallace just because you think you can get greedy and do better because similar to offensive linemen, it's really easy to do way worse than to find an upgrade. It's really easy to find a terrible player. So I agree with you. If Dane Jackson beats him and wins that starting job, then great for the Bills because that means two things. That means, one, you got a great backup with Levi Wallace, and two, Dane Jackson might be the upgrade that fans have been wanting over Levi Wallace, but if Levi Wallace wins the starting battle, I don't think it's push the panic button. I don't think it, it, it's worth freaking out over because he's a, a, a at the bare minimum, he's a average cornerback who is steady. He doesn't get a lot of penalties. He's a relatively okay tackler. He's a fundamentally pretty sound football player. You know, at the end of the day, you got to shut down corner across the field and Trey White. So you know half the field's be taken away, and you got two great safeties. Like not every player in the secondary, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is going to be at this top notch level that the you know that the other three guys that they have are. It's like it's like playing goalie. If you play goalie in hockey or soccer. You know you you're supp- not you're supposed to, but you're going to let goals up. You're not going to stop everything, and it's just that when a wide receiver gets burnt or a wide receiver gets beat, it's just always super easy to see. And that's just kind of the case. And when you have a guy who's who's above a replacement level player, Levi Wallace, you know, it just, I think sometimes the eye test isn't always fair when it, when it comes to really evaluating where they stand in terms of the league at large. And now the bottom, and you get towards the bottom half of this position group, and there's a lot of other interesting names in this position group. And like a lot of the other positions, that last spot is going to kind of come down to who can contribute on special teams. Saran Neal is probably one of the most important special teams players on this team. I forgot who it was on Rico's show when came in and said uh, that Saran Neal might be the fastest player on the team from that gunner spot. You also have Richard Wild Goose, who, you know, I think a lot of people are just memeing because of his name but a guy who's probably the most athletically gifted or at least the fastest in this group, Uh, Ojalai Griffin, who we've talked about as a possible guy for making this team. And even a a guy like Nick McLeod, who had some draft type coming in before going undrafted. So is there anyone on this bottom half of the roster that you think can one way or another find their way onto the roster? I think out of all those guys you just mentioned, um, I think Wild Goose, I'll give him the highest probability because pro- probability 
because he's not only a draft pick, but you know that the Bills don't like cutting draft picks, although it is getting harder and harder to keep them all just because of how good this roster is. But for what you just said, uh, I believe he ran in the low four fours, which is way faster than pretty much every other quarterback on the Bills roster. So as a special teams aspect, you like that. And this is a guy that does have some inside outside versatility, which again, the Bills love that versatility big time in the secondary. So out of, like Griffin, Wild Goose, Cam Lewis, um, McLeod. I, I think Wild Goose is the guy that I that, and that's if they're keeping six cornerbacks. That's another thing we have to kind of consider here, Ryan, because Trey White, Levi Wallace, Dean Jackson, Taron Johnson, Saron Neal, they're all making this team. If they even want six cornerbacks, I think it's going to be Wild Goose who makes it, but we're not even sure they're keeping six. It might be only five cornerbacks. They tend to have, they, they, McDermott has done that quite a bit over his time as built uh, as the head coach is keep only five corners. I think it'll be tough to keep five just because of how I think you're going to want that backup. Mm-hmm. And if you're regardless, if you start Wallace or Jackson, you're going to want one of them to be a backup. And that gives you three outside corners Teron Johnson, obviously as your slot corner. And I just, I, I don't think there's a path for Saran Neal not to be on this team. He's just, you know, I, I think you can talk, you can talk your way out of Bam Johnson being on this team. You can talk your way out of some of these other special team players who who have been able to survive as special team players the last couple of years. But Saran Neal has been talked about multiple times as being a a very important part of what Heath Farwell does. And I mean, you can watch him on, on punt returns. He's always getting down there. The Bills had a very good special teams unit in large part because of him. So I, I don't see there's a how there's a way unless someone else comes up and really is spectacular to make this roster. And the thing is, I like the guys. Like you said, Wild Goose, great athletic talent. Griffin, I, we talked about when we talked about undrafted free agents, we talked about his old July Griffin is a guy who could make this team. And then I think it's important to note that, you know, people say, well, we don't want to lose Wild Goose. Well, we don't want to lose Griffin. We don't want to lose these guys. It's not, I I think the first time in three, I forgot who it was, but the Bills have lost like one guy they waived out of training camp. I, I think it's was Vincent Taylor. Vincent Taylor. Was. That was it. Vincent Taylor was the only guy in the last like three years that they've lost to another team. So if you're someone who's saying, well, we don't want to lose these people. We got to keep them on the roster. No one's going to come take our seventh round pick. No one's going to come take our undrafted free agent. So many teams also want to develop their own seventh round picks and their own undrafted free agents that I don't think we have to worry about losing some of these players that could we maybe Justin Zimmer, if he gets cut, right? He's produced, he has tape out there, but I don't think it'll be very hard if Wild Goose, if Griffin, if they don't make this team, I think it'll be fairly easy to storm on the practice squad, let them learn, let them develop, especially with these new expanded practice squad rules, and, and just keep them in house for a year or two and let them and let them keep on learning. And maybe one day they will be a contributor. Absolutely, I, I, I it's very easy because we as fans, you know, we look at the team so closely, so we, you know, we think that oh, you know, we have this young corner, this young receiver, or whatever that we can't lose because we think you know, there might be something there but every team believes that about someone on their roster as well you know and i think outside of really offensive line or any player that has put nfl tape out there like a justin zimmer right i think it was I- ike bucker was another guy who might have been claimed if i'm not mistaken i think too a couple of years ago that might have been the only other guy other than vincent taylor other than that guys like that who have played in the nfl who play at premium positions in the nfl I don't think fans need to worry about a wild goose or an Ojalai Griffin getting sweeped up off, you know, getting poached, right, you know, right off of waivers. I, I, it's a good chance these guys are going to pass through. And I, I said this last episode, I'm going to say it again. Brandon Bean has been a genius by using the injured reserve as almost a red shirt in the NFL. He did it with Isaiah Hodgins last year, right? He's done it in the, in the past before. I'm not ruling out that he doesn't do that with another draft pick this year. I said, I think it could be a guy like Marquez Stevenson. Maybe it's a wild goose, but he's tended to do that over the last two years. Just saying that, that there's a, there's likely that one of these late round draft picks is going to fall under that umbrella when it comes to cut day. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Voshan Joseph is mm -hmm. always that possibility. You know, another guy that, and you know, another guy that I think I know we kind of breeze over the safeties and who were there, but Tariq Thompson is a guy mm -hmm. you talk you talked about in in guys you wanted to be drafted in the late round to me the Bills picked up as an undrafted free agent that they may want to protect. And and I will say before we we kind of move on here because we're getting to the end. I don't – Jaquan Johnson's been on this team for a long time. Um, Tree Thompson's a guy who did have a little bit of draft hype. I think there's a, a world where maybe, hey, we, we've given Jaquan Johnson long enough. I, I There's – may not be – I know there's a lot of Jaquan Johnson fans out there. But, hey, I, I think there's a world where maybe our backup and, may, you know, maybe they don't want two rookies back there, but maybe there's a world where we have Tree Thompson and DeMar Hamlin as backups. So – you know, just some something that's important to note. I think there's a lot of really interesting back end stories uh, on this defense as a whole, especially with some of these undrafted free agents and, and late round draft picks and, and the talents that they bring to the table. Absolutely, I, I I couldn't agree with you there more. And not to mention too, you know, the Bills do have specifically at safety. If you want to keep on that battle, I mean, Micah Hyde and Joy Poyer, although are still terrific players, are getting a little bit older. You know, there are guys who. You know how much, how many more years they have playing at this high level? You might want to start kind of preparing for the future just a little bit. So uh, that'll be certainly interesting to watch uh, with training camp and with preseason. And again, we're getting so close to that, so it's it's getting really exciting. Before we sign off, me and Ryan, we talked about it, you know, before we started recording. But we wanted to also throw special teams in here, and there's not much to really talk about with the special teams. Tyler Bass was outstanding, I would say, for a rookie kicker. Yes, he had his struggles. In the beginning of the season, but this dude was clutch. He made huge kicks. Uh, he's a great kickoff guy. The days of having a kickoff specialist are over now officially, which thank God for that. You know, they got Matt Hawk, which I know some people were sad to see Bohorquez go, but honestly, right? I think they, th this is going to sound very like kind of confident and cocky, but I really do wonder do you think the Bills? Signed Mac Hawk because Bo Horkis was not a very good holder. He had a lot of problems having the laces facing the kicker's foot, which is a big no-no for holding the football on, on place kicks. Do you think the Bills were really thinking, man, we punted so little last off last season that we might as well invest in a punter who is a really top-notch holder rather than a guy who can boom 150 yards at any given time? I'm I just think, curious what you think of that. I, I think one of the big issues with Bo is even more so than the holding, because I think from what I've read – Sometimes holding, you know, can be an issue with the way the long snapper snaps it. And, to, and you know, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't know what the step-by-step -step procedures are getting to hold, but I, I think it may have been a more holistic issue last year. But I think one thing that's important to note, because I see a lot of people that, even even Manny was saying it last year, I mean, not last, was saying it when I was on with him Tuesday night on Rico's show, that, you know, why did why did we get rid of Bojo? He was able to punt it so far, all this stuff. I think it's important to note that, uh, yeah, he could bunt it. Yeah, he could flip the field. But one thing Bojo couldn't do was consistently put teams inside the 20. He had a lot of, a lot of ball, a lot of touchbacks. And I think Matt Hawk, if you look at his numbers, does a little bit of a better job of pinning guys and there's a little bit better of a job with that directional punting. Obviously something, hopefully we don't have to use a whole ton. And I think it was just a philosophical change in the way Heath Farwell kind of wants to play special teams as opposed to maybe more of some of the issues that Bojo had with holding. Bojo went out and still got a pretty decent sized contract for punters with the Rams this off season. Definitely. Definitely. But Ultimately, special teams, Ryan, there's one battle that is going to be talked about. And honestly, God, might be the most fierce battle that there's going to be in all, all training camp and preseason. That's the returner battle between Mackenzie Stevenson. And I guess you could throw in Brandon Powell in there because he's a part of the mix, too. It's probably going to be one of those three guys. I know some people want to see Matt Burita be the kick returner. I don't personally think that that's what the direction the Bills are going to go in. It comes down to those three. And there's not much to really talk about here. We didn't kind of talk about this a lot in our last episode, but I'm just going to ask you right here, Ryan, flat out, who wins? Who wins the return of duty? This will come no surprise for anyone who's been following me, 
who listen to Rico show on Tuesday or listens to anything I've been saying all off season, this job is Stevenson's to lose. Uh, I'll try to avoid a lot of the talking points that I had in the past, but he's just, I, I don't trust McKenzie as a returner. I know his drop issues were two years ago. He's all he's had is one punt return since then. Buffalo had every opportunity to give him more chances since then. They only let him return punts once. I think Stevenson, although he didn't return a ton of punts in college, is the superior, superior kick returner. I think he can figure it out on punt return. He gives you more as a wide receiver, so he gives you more of, the, of a dual threat issue in that regard too. So if I was a betting man, give me Marquez Stevenson every day and, and twice on Sunday. Interesting, interesting. Now, Ryan, you've been banging that drum uh, since the day I think they drafted him. But, you know, it, it's fair, though, because there's no question Seedson has had an amazing career as a kick returner. I think just for now I'm going to lean towards McKenzie just because out of all these guys, McKenzie is a veteran and he does offer value as an actual player in the offense. Um, I'm not going to rule out Powell, though. I think I think that's a name to keep an eye on. I don't, I don't think he did much last year as a kick returner. But the one thing is that he has experience as both a kick and punt returner. He doesn't fumble the ball, and he clearly has some returnability. I don't think he's just going to Micah Hyde and fair catch it every time. So I'm just going to throw that out there, especially if McKenzie and Stevenson both prove that they can't handle the returner duties. It might just be by default, pal. So I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not saying that as the guy I'm rooting for, I'd like to see McKenzie or Stevenson win it. But... I don't think we can roll Powell quite yet. Well, yeah, I mean, again, as you know, I, I think there's value in having functional ability at the position. And he's returned punts and kicks in the NFL. And I think that has value as opposed to two guys who have not been, who either haven't had a chance to do it in the NFL yet or haven't done it successfully in the NFL yet. Absolutely. All right, so that about wraps it up here for our defensive special teams training camp preview. Uh, before we sign off, Ryan, anything you want to let our viewers know? Uh, no, just keep keep on following all the stuff we do. Follow us at 585 Report. Follow us at our Twitter tags. You know what they are. You can see them. In, if you're on YouTube, you can see them in below our names here. And... Uh, this is my last show for three weeks. I'm going on a nice little vacation. Bitch is going to do a great job in my absence. And then when we get back, we have uh when I get back on the 19th, we have a special guest for you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to just be me for a little bit, but I do have some guests. I'm hoping I'm having on uh, during Ryan's vacation, but Ryan, you definitely deserve the vac vacation because I've been off a little bit this past <laughs> month. It, this summer has been crazy people. You got no idea, but um, yeah, but we've been, Holding it down here. So uh, with that being said, thank you so much for listening. For Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Have a great rest of your day and go Bills.